It's great to see everyone tonight. Thank you for coming out after the past few years. It's always wonderful to be with a group of people, not on a screen. Uh, so it's, it's lovely to be, for you all to be here tonight. Uh, as Madeline said, uh, I'm the Cultural Heritage and Recreation Coordinator for Lake Champlain Basin Program. What does that mean? Um, my job basically boils down to this. My job is to focus on having people get a better appreciation for the lake. How do they get that appreciation? Well, some people go canoeing on, on Lake Champlain, some people kayak, some people go scuba diving, some people sail, some people just like to sit in their Adirondack chair and look out at the lake and just enjoy the scenery that we're blessed with here. So that, that appreciation is one thing. The next step for that is an understanding. So when you're out there paddling through uh, the reeds along the shoreline of Lake Champlain, you wanna start thinking about what, what you're actually seeing. What's, what's special about that ecosystem that you're, you're getting into? What's, uh, what are the birds that you're seeing? What are the, what are the fish that live under the water there? Um, and so like that, the understanding really leads to stewardship. Because the more you start to understand the special place we live in, the better steward of the, of the place you're going to become, right? We all try to focus on, on what makes us feel good, that, that, that appreciation part. Well, that, again, that appreciation leads to understanding, understanding leads to stewardship. This is part of the Jane Potvin Lecture Series. Jane Potvin was a longtime friend of the Lake Champlain Basin Program. Uh, she worked for us at times when we needed her. Uh, she was also a state legislator. Um, and the Jane Potvin Lecture Series is entitled Love the Lake because sim simply Jane loved the lake and she had an appreciation for the lake. She grew that understanding for the lake and, and became a better steward for the lake. And so one of the things that, that helps people better appreciate and understand any topic is the arts, right? We all studied art in, in high school and maybe college. Um, art has played a major, major role in the conservation movement. I mean, think of back in the early 1800s when people were isolated. We didn't have transportation systems that we have now. We didn't have media that we have now. There was a group of painters in, uh, out, of, out of the Hudson River, called the Hudson River School, that started developing landscape paintings for America's scenic wonders. Uh, stuff that is as grandiose as Yosemite and as, as simple as the Connecticut River Valley, uh, the next watershed over. In fact, there's several beautiful uh, Hudson River School paintings uh, made of Lake Champlain. So, that was really the, the start for, for, for American citizens to get a better understanding of what was out there beyond the cities, beyond the little villages that they lived in. Art continued to, to help change the way we looked at things with, say, the photographs of, uh, of the progressive era where children were working. There's these great photographs of children working in, uh, in uh, uh, sweatshops and in mills, which changed the child labor laws. You fast forward to, to the Vietnam War. The music was a, was a major conduit for people to get a better understanding of what the soldiers over there were facing and, and how the ge geopolitical issue had come, come about and why we were in that war. And one that's very poignant for me that really gave me a better understanding of an issue um, through the arts was the AIDS quilt um, that was done in the late 80s, early 90s. We heard the numbers. Right? We, we, we heard that, that, that people were dying from this, this new disease, but really that, that, that quilt covering massive amounts of the, of the National Mall really drove it home. That there was families all over America that were dealing with the, the immense grief of losing a son or a daughter to this disease. And it continues today. And so the Lake Champlain Basin Program, our boss, uh, Eric Howe, um, decided that we should develop this, this artist in residence program to help people who don't kayak or scuba dive or, 
or sit on the side of the lake and, and gra gra grow that appreciation and understanding of the of the lake. But the people who who like the, like art and art as visual arts, uh, me, uh, multimedia arts, uh, music, and that's what we're talking about here tonight. And so uh, this is our third artist in residence program that uh, the Basin program has supported. Um, there was a really good one in Saranac Lake, New York. <coughs> I brought together artists working with a scientist to interpret water quality issues. Um, they used painting, uh, multimedia, paper arts, which I always found was fantastically ironic because of the eutrophication associated with paper mills on Lake Champlain. Uh, we also had a, uh, a artist in residence in, um, on the Winooski River, where two artists would work with uh, grammar school children, middle school children, and high school children. And they learned to interpret water quality through the arts. And our third uh, uh, artist in residence program um, it was sponsored by the Adirondack North Country Association. Um, and uh, I want to introduce the, the, the primary contact for this project and the primary driver for this contract, contact. Um, it, it's, this is um, Glenn McClure, and Glenn it, uh, teaches humanities at Paul Smith's College. So I'd like to welcome Professor McClure to uh, say a few words. And once uh, Glenn is done, uh, my colleague and friend and our associate scientist for the Lake Champlain Basin Program will talk a little bit about the da data that Glenn is going to uh, interpret through music. I'm really looking forward to this presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> uh, thank you so much for coming out t tonight. and and. And oh my God, thank you for all of those things over there too. Um, in in my uh, in my uh, life of uh, of being being a, a composer and working in different parts of of, of the world, I, I found out that very few things, uh, uh, very few few big things happen without good food attached to it in in, in some way. So, so um, <laughs> welcome. Yes, uh, watershed voices. This is a two-year project with the Lake Champlain Basin. Program, uh, and um, and and what what we'll be doing is writing music, okay, uh, about the 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 Champlain watershed, okay, from the perspectives of Vermont and New York and Quebec, uh, performing music in those places, as well, um, and um, and uh, and trying to 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 listen to the lake in a new way. Uh, okay, uh, to, to give the lake a new way to speak to us and to sing to us. Uh, it, just so we know what's coming, uh, coming ahead of us here in the, in the next two years, uh, I'm going to be uh, mentoring three composers of, uh, of different, different musical backgrounds uh, that, that will be taking various data from the lake and, and using that data as the inspiration for their music, okay, and, and they'll interpret that data um, w w within their, their own musical styles and their own musical traditions, and so what we're seeing tonight really is, uh, is very much a kickoff for the program, so, so thank you all for being here for this, uh, to, uh, to, to, to share uh, the process of what our composers are, are going to be going through, and actually you, you folks are going to get a chance to do a little bit of that process uh, yourselves here tonight. So, um, watershed voices, giving the, giving the lake a musical voice. Um, what we're talking about is a particular kind of, of composing technique, okay, that has existed in classical music, um, it, mostly in, in, the, um, in the sort of parts of classical music conservatories that have been dealing with electronic music, okay. Sonification has mostly lived in that world, okay. My interest here for this project is to take it out of that world and into, uh, into the sort of human performance. And, uh, and what sonification is, okay, is basically the translation of numbers into sound. Now, when all of you were in third grade, your teacher taught you how to translate a bunch of 
numbers into a picture, right? We call those line graphs and bar graphs. Because, of course, if you look at data in a, in a 2D expression, that allows us to experience the, 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 the truth behind that data. The data can, sp can speak to us in a new way by seeing it in a picture that we can't if we're just looking at an endless list of numbers in front of us, right? Well, sonification is just simply the act of making a musical graph, okay? Translating these numbers into, into a musical picture uh, in, in some way. Um, uh, why do this? Okay, well, well it's, it's, a, it's a new way to, um, it, it's a new se sense to bring into the, into the experience of science. Okay, we are a profoundly visual culture. We like to look at things. We like to analyze things with our eyes, but there's very few professions that actually require a person to use their ears in an analytical capacity. Uh, those, uh, you know, among the short list of those professions, uh, a musician, a sonar director, and an ornithologist. All right? But the rest of us mostly use our hearing in a very passive way. Okay? We, we, um, we interpret the world around us kind of passively. Uh, you know, if, if for, for example, in the middle of my presentation, okay, I could tell if, if someone went out and started their car without having to, to look through the wall to see the car was there because I could hear it through that break, that door in the wall, right? Okay, that would tell me what that is, right? Okay, but, 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 but that's a passive thing. We, 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 most of us don't study how, how to use our ears to analyze things in, 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 a, in a deep and profound kind of way. Sonification opens that up, okay? It, it opens up the possibility for, for visually impaired scientists to now to do deep data analysis. Okay, because, because now they'll have access to, 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 to data in the same way that the rest of the seeing world um, ha has always had the luxury of, of doing. Um, uh, another reason to do it is that you find new musical stories in the data. I, I know every, every year when, when I go uh, around tax time, okay, and I go over to the, the accountant, uh, this, this, this marvelous man who's had great patience with me over, over the years of running a music business, and, and, he, and, and Tom, Tom would, would look at me as I, as I handed him all the paperwork with the, with the profit and loss statement and all that, and, and Tom would gently look at me with this sort of calm voice, and he would say, Glenn, I know that you look at this and just see a bunch of numbers. When I look at this, I see a story of what your business did this year. Okay, and that's what we want to do musically with the lake. Okay, we we want to take these uh, amazing data sets uh, co collected by 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 the scientists among us uh, to, to 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 listen to the lake in a new way, to hear the stories that the lake has has to tell us. So. Um, so let's let's ju just <laughs> just take a look at at the at the background of this sort of cultural background. Yes, uh, Jim said I'm I'm a humanities teacher, so so yes, we have to start in ancient Greece. Okay, um, that 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 it turns out this guy named Pythagoras did more than just simply write that equation that that tenth graders have to use on their uh, <laughs> on their regents exams. Um, he, he, he actually had, a, had some pretty broad theories about how the world was put together and what happiness was and, and, and how to cultivate a good life. Uh, in, in southern, what we now call southern Italy, he had this, this, this place which is kind of half monastery, half, um, half you know, club med right, uh, for, for, for people to come and study these new ways of seeking happiness in the world. Uh, one of the things that, 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 that Pythagoras gives us uh, through his many, many teachers and, 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 and chroniclers, he says, he says this, this thing, all is number. Everything is numbers. <laughs> well, any scientist among us knows that that's what, that's your job, is, is to is to take all that nice stuff out there and turn it into a number, and a list of numbers, so we can study it, right? 
Okay, everything is number. And, and he had these really interesting ideas. He said that if you just have numbers alone, all you have is arithmetic. If you put numbers in space, then you get geometry. That makes sense, right? Okay, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, triangle, right? right? Here's where it gets interesting. Pythagoras says that numbers in time equals music. And then when it gets really interesting, he says when you put numbers in space and time, you get astronomy. Okay, this, 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 this ancient notion of the music of the spheres where, where the, the, the heavenly bodies moved around in the sky in this harmonic, in this musical kind of, of balanced way okay, that, that, that the ancient Greeks saw. But, but, but Pythagoras is a good place for us to, to begin our journey here. Um, also, one of the uh, a later Greek, okay, this fellow named Aristotle, he had this really interesting idea. He said, that, he said that everything in the world has two qualities to it. One is essence, the other is accidents. The essence of something is the, is the eternal thing that never changes. The accidents of that thing is just simply the temporary expression of whatever the essence is. So, so for example, okay, okay, you are looking at 57-year-old Glenn right now, right? Okay, you're looking at Glenn, you're, you're hearing me do my thing, right? Okay, but you're looking at the 57-year-old version of that, okay? When I was nine, I was still Glenn. There was an essence of me at an, as a nine-year-old that I still carry with me now at 57. But the expression of that was much, di much different. It was much shorter, it was much skinnier. <laughs> Okay, uh, much goofier. Okay, well, 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 well maybe not. Okay, um, but 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 the expression of that essence of glenness still exists between those two times, and I and I hope that when I'm 85 years old, there's some part of that essence which still still persists. So 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 in this case, you, you, you know the the. All of these things, all of these three things, are, are all the essence of what a right triangle is. There's a picture, there are some words, and then there's an equation. So we transfer the essence of something through numbers and into other expressions. Uh, and, and so this notion of sonification allows us to do that, right? We, we, we look at the beautiful lake out there. We, we, we feel the breeze, okay, okay, we, we enjoy it, but then we study it, right, okay? Looking at the lake, you know, from the perspective of an Adirondack chair gives us an, an, some of the essence of the lake in a certain expression, okay? The numbers from scientists give us an expression of, of that essence in a different way. Okay, and so now what we're going to do is, with the help of those numbers, turn, turn things into, um, into some music. So how do composers paint these musical pictures? Okay, um, lots of times composers like to, uh, to, to imitate the sounds of nature. Okay, if, um, if, if you remember, okay, watching, watching that beautiful rain scene, in the Disney movie Bambi, okay, where the, where the raindrops are falling, right, and you see all the little creatures in the, in the forest, and the orchestra goes doop, 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 uh, sometimes we might use cultural sounds, okay, uh, if, if, if we are, are telling uh, the indigenous story of, of Lake Champlain, okay, well, 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 well perhaps we want to use, use a water drum, we want to use those instruments that, that reference a certain cultural experience of the lake. But then w when we get into these abstract sounds, this is where, this is where it gets kind of fun, <coughs> okay? Now, 
I'm going to sing two notes. And I want you to tell me what picture comes up in your mind. Only two notes. Two notes played on the lowest string of a cello. Da dum. A shark. Now let's just ask, ask the question here, okay, right? Okay. Does a shark sound like a cello when it swims? <laughs> no. Okay, so it's not the, Im the imitative thing, right? Okay. Does, does the shark play like cello in the coral reef community orchestra? <laughs> no, so it's not a cultural thing, right? So why is it that those two notes on a cello for almost every American and, and probably lots of other folks around the world bring that specific image up. Well, John Williams, the composer, okay, the, the greatest film composer of our time, right? He wrote those two notes, right? But of course, he didn't, he, he wrote just not two notes. He put them in context, right? It starts off, da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum, dum 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 Right? So, look what John Williams does. If you take away the two notes, that minor second, okay, that, the, 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 that he writes between those two notes, and you just listen to the rhythm, what did John Williams do for us? Dum, 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 dum. What is that? No, what, 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 what? It's, a it, it, it's a heartbeat, right? And it's a heartbeat when you are feeling how? Scared. Excited or scared, right? Right. Now, now, now had John Williams just just simply, um, uh, you know, put that in the bass drum part, and and the bass drum went doom doom, doomed all of us. We like, oh come on, John, that's a heartbeat. <laughs> Can't you think a little bit bigger than this here, John? Right? But no, what, what did he do? He put the heartbeat rhythm in it, but then he added that minor second, da dum, which is an inherently um, dissonant interval. It, 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 it's a, it, it, it creates tension in us, right? Frequencies do that, okay, in, in that interval. And, and so because he adds those two notes to it, now it's not a general fear of anything. It's actually a specific fear of that thing that we saw on on the movie when we heard it. And now forever, humanity will always associate those two notes with a big nasty shark that's about to eat them up. <laughs> okay, um, the other thing that John Williams did with that, by the way, okay, um, in playing with the heartbeat, uh, one of the things that, 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 that a lot of, um, of, uh, 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 of work in, in music and health has been starting to uncover is that when, when we feel that a, a piece of music is slow, that normally means that the tempo of that is slower than our standing heart rate is. When we feel that the music is fast, that means it's above our standing heart rate. Okay, why do, why do professional athletes listen to fast rhythmic Music, why do they listen to that just before the game? They, when, you, when you say pumped up, what, what happens is that when, when we listen to music, our heart wants to adjust to the tempo that's being played toward it. Physiologically, we do this without even thinking about it, right? And so, <laughs> and so it, it, we get into this world of abstract sounds, right, where, where, where we can create these musical symbols for specific things um, in, in nature. Um, one of the, the, the marvelous groups of scientists I worked with a few years back was at the European Space Agency. Uh, the Rosetta mission, uh, you may have, um, you may recall uh, a few years back, um, the Europeans uh, flew a, an orbiter for nine years they flew this thing, and after nine years, that orbiter came around and encountered a comet and then dropped a lander on the comet. First time in human history that has ever been done. An astonishing feat of, of scientific genius and, and persistence and, and hard work. It was just amazing, and, and I got to hang out with the mathematicians that flew that, flew that satellite 
for nine years, right? And so um, they gave me the, this data from the, from the day that the orbiter encountered the comet after this long nine-year journey, okay, and finally had reached its, its goal. And, um, and, and what this is, is the, um, the, the, um, uh, the uh, um, trajectory of, of, the, um, <laughs> of the orbiter, okay, on those days when it, it arrived. Okay, so, so you can see over here, um, 2014, okay, okay, that was the year, okay, the, 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 this, this is the, <laughs> the day here. Okay, and then these are all, all of the other geometric points that help them steer this thing, okay? I took that data and um, sonified it, okay, with, with, with this mathematical process, okay, we're gonna talk, we're, we're gonna do a little bit of this a, a little bit later in, in, the, in our time here. Um, uh, it, it's called modular mathematics, <laughs> okay? You, you, you uh, take a list of numbers, you find the difference between the lowest and the highest, you divide it up into equal chunks, okay, and those are m modules, modules of data, and then you go back and, and, and align those with musical notes. We're going to be doing those, do, do, doing that in a second here, um, but what I ended up with was a, was a piece of music that was for choir and string quartet, okay, uh, because of course the European Space Agency has its own choir and its own string quartet. <laughs> it also has a theater group, it has a dance group, it has, it has painting lessons, sculpture lessons. They really value this connection between science, scientists and, and artists. Uh, I, 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 I don't think NASA has all of those things, but, but um, not a very American thing. But um, here's, um, here's that piece of music. It's called uh, uh, Variations on a Day in Space. And uh, th the first thing that you hear is the raw sonified data. I didn't change a thing. It's what came from the math. And, and, and of course, this is gonna be parallel data sets, as you saw, okay, uh, uh, with, <laughs> with the flight data. So if you have parallel data sets, well, you read them vertically and horizontally. If you have parallel musical lines, you not only get melodies, but you also get Harmonies, and you read it vertically, right? Okay, so 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 um, uh, so I took four of those data sets and sonified it, and, um, and and so the first variation is just the raw sonification, and then there's two other variations of which, as a composer, I played with it a little a, a little while here. So here we go.
Um, most of those images were the images that the orbiter took of the comet <laughs> itself. And the images corresponded to the what was happening as it as it moved closer and. Um, the the um, not not in a straight line because I, actually what we did was was variations on, on, on the same set set of data that was repeated. Okay, but the but, but the idea is of course is that we create the sort of core musical content and then composers do what composers do with it, right? Okay, and and, and in this case, uh, you know, is shooting for that for that longing. Um, uh, oh. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, um, it, in, it, in this case, I was I was shooting for the that 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 sense of longing of of traveling for nine years in 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 in, in the emptiness of space, and then finally finding that thing that you had traveled so long long to seek out. And um, I'm so glad that space is oh, it, it, and and it's astonishing that, that yeah that, that, that just 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 running it through the sonification did that. <laughs> I didn't even have to do that myself, so so it was it was it was wonderful. Um, one other example here before we start to put all of you to work, okay? Um, uh, and the Adirondack Folk Opera Project I've been uh, involved in over in in the High Peaks area, uh, re uh, retelling this pre-Civil War voting rights story that that, that happened in, in our, our our town with 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 John Brown and Frederick Douglass and 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 some other other big names in the abolition business in the 1850s. Um, we wanted to embed that, you, you know, the, 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 the landscape into the piece. And so one of the pieces that we did uh, is, is this uh, tune called Procession of the Pines. It's, it's a setting of a portion of, of Ralph Waldo Emerson's poem called The Adirondacks. <laughs> okay, and, um, and in the, uh, in the first part of of the tune, okay. This is just uh, uh, just me writing writing some music that that's referential to the the, the mid 19th century and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but but then what happens in the last section of the piece? Once you hear the piano come in, okay. The piano part is the sonified uh, version of some data that. Um, but I'm, I'm just going to move out of the, the the PowerPoint just just for a second here. Um, my my friend uh, and colleague Kurt Steger, okay, who who also ha has has supported some some of these of these basin uh, these these Lake Champlain basin artist and residence programs. He himself is a wonderful banjo player, by the way, um, and and climate scientist. Um, he, he took lake core samples from Wolf Lake, okay, which is also part of the watershed here. And, um, and, and he was measuring, okay, uh, various things at each level of those lake core samples. And, and his data set uh, starts up here in 2012, right over here. And because he dug down deep enough, his data set goes all the way down to the year 337. So, so it, it's an astonishing climate record, okay, um, uh, going back all the way to the, the time of the Roman Empire uh, he, he, here, he, he, here in Wolf Lake. And, um, and, and so what you see here, okay, are the, th these, these, these measurements of, of diatoms, okay, which were, were um, ways to, to in interpret the, the, um, the, 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 the various elements of climate, okay, uh, <laughs> here are those measurements. Okay, this is the, th the actual measurement of the core sample itself. Okay, and then and then here are two columns of sonified musical notes that that, that come from from the the, the, the process we're going to show you in just a second. Um, one of them we would call mod seven, meaning you're translating these numbers into seven notes. Do re mi fa sol la ti. And do is just the same as do, right? But a little bit higher, right? Okay, so 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 mod seven would be to take a whole bunch of numbers and translate them into seven notes. The second column is mod eleven. G 
you're going to use all of the white and the black keys of, of the piano and get a different musical expression out of that. So, so when we get to the um, when we get to the piano, you're going to hear uh, he, he, hear Wolf Lake, okay, speaking to us from uh, f from the years 1840 to 1860. <laughs> Sorry about that. There we go. Okay. All day, all day we swept the lake. All day. Searched every cove, north from Gap Maple, south to Osprey Bay, beholding the procession of the pines. Oh, watching when the dog should drive the deer. Rough service for a trout, challenging echo by our guns and cries, beholding the procession of the pines. Oh, paths winding from the rocks and no. Let's segue to uh, to a little a little champagne, sh 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 champagne um, data here. Yeah, so. thank you so much. Um, I'm glad to be a part of this event tonight. So my name is May Kate Campbell, and I'm on the science team at the Lake Champlain Basin Program. Um, and I'm going to tell you the story behind the data that we are going to be working on um, sonifying, turning into music tonight. Um, so as uh, Glenn mentioned, one of the ways that scientists approach um, the problem of understanding the world around us is by trying to um, interpret data, have numerical measurements, you know, think about how we can change the landscape or whatever we're interested in measuring into numbers, and then being able to look at those numbers um, through time. Um, so in Lake Champlain, one thing that we're interested in is water quality. 
Um, and we measure that in a number of different ways. A lot of times we look at um, elements or ions that are dissolved in the water and other measures of water quality. Um, traditionally, what this has looked like in terms of monitoring is we actually have um, scientists, people who go out on a boat, collect a water sample, take it back to the lab and do all sorts of measurements to tell you what's in that water um, and use that as a measurement of water quality. Um, recently, we've acquired some new technology um, that helps us take those measurements um, in kind of more real time and get a higher resolution of data. Um, so the data that we're going to be looking at today comes from one of our water quality monitoring buoys. Um, so this buoy um, actually takes a measurement of eight different water quality parameters, which I'll talk a little bit more about the parameters in a couple minutes. Um, it takes a measurement once every 15 minutes. So now instead of maybe once every other week when someone's able to actually get out in the field, scoop some water and take it back to the lab, um, we can see the water quality changing um, much more in real time. Um, so here's a couple pictures of the buoy. Um, so on the right, you see the buoy as it's deployed. Um, this particular buoy is in the Lamoille River. Um, so it's actually anchored in the river and then we have a, a safety chain attaching it. You can see that bridge in the photo. Um, that's the Route 2 bridge right after you get off the exit for the islands off of 89. So we've probably all driven over that many times. Not sure if you knew there was a, a data buoy out there collecting data right under your wheels. Um, and the picture on the left shows kind of the, the guts of the buoy. Um, so that instrument that is on the person's knee there in the picture is actually the sensors. So they sit a little bit below the buoy, a little bit um, beneath the water surface. And like I said, every 15 minutes, they take a measurement of these different um, water quality parameters. So, so one of the stories behind the data that we're going to be um, taking a look at tonight comes from the perspective of this buoy um, as it was in the Lamoille River during the flood event that we had last month. Um, so this buoy had a wild ride. <laughs> um, so typically it's just hanging out here on the surface of the water, taking that measurement every 15 minutes. Um, but as the water levels started to rise, um, we actually got to a point where this buoy was completely submerged. So usually we can kind of communicate with the buoy. Um, it actually can connect to the cell network and it actually sends that data to a website so we can look at it shortly after it's collected. Um, we were keeping an eye as the water was starting to rise um, and we saw it getting higher and higher up on this buoy, which is supposed to be floating. Um, so that wasn't ideal. Um, and actually at one point, we couldn't find the buoy. We had no idea, this is you know tens of thousands of dollars of scientific instrumentation. Um, we weren't sure if the current had gotten so strong that this buoy had actually gotten washed away. Um, it was no longer transmitting data. That wasn't a great sign. Um, so we were worried that we were going to have to go out into the lake and actually search for the buoy to see if it had gotten um, washed downstream. Um, however, as the water level started to recede, um, I was actually able to go out in the field and um, take a look from the shore to try to find the buoy. And as I was looking over the river, I could see just the tiniest bit of yellow starting to stick back up from the water. So I excitedly told my um, teammates that the buoy was still there. It, it held on for dear life through the flood. Um, and eventually, as the water continued to recede, um, the buoy actually began communicating again. Um, we weren't sure, it's not supposed to be completely submerged, um, but as it began communicating, we realized that even though it was underwater, it was still able to take its measurements every 15 minutes. <laughs> so as scientists, as data geeks, when we got all of these numbers, a, a real-time record of what was coming down the Lamoille River during this major flood event, um, we were really excited to get to you know, see the story of the flood, um, both from the perspective of the buoy and from the data it's collecting. So just to get a visual sense of the data that we're going to be looking at before we get to the auditory sense, um, I've chosen a couple parameters that had some pretty dramatic changes, as you can imagine, um, we sometimes get during a flood event. So on this graph, there's two measurements that the buoy was taking. Um, the blue line at the top shows temperature, 
And the orange line, um, closer to the bottom, but obviously with that big spike there, um, is turbidity. So turbidity is a measurement of the clarity of the water. And along the bottom here, um, this is time that we have. So this is a record of temperature and turbidity over time. Um, and it starts at the beginning of July and ends at the end of July. So over time, you can see um, everything, this, the scale is pretty dramatic here um, since we have that huge increase in turbidity. So you can imagine from the perspective of the buoy, if we're you know, thinking about that orange line, you know, stable, stable, stable. And then suddenly we see this huge spike in turbidity. So as we, as we had the floodwaters coming off of the landscape and coming down the Lamoille River, there was sediment and other um, you know, dissolved ions and other particulate matter coming off of the landscape that got washed into the river and reduced the clarity um, as this flood event was happening. So you can see turbidity starts off pretty low, um, spikes pretty dramatically. We have a couple smaller spikes and then at the end of the month, everything kind of settles back out to the pre-flood condition. Um, the other parameter we have here is temperature. Um, you can see there's a little bit more variation kind of day to day or week to week in the temperature record. Um, but at the same time that we see that huge spike in turbidity, we see a drop in temperature. You can see that sharp, almost vertical line down. So the water that was getting pushed into the river um, coming off of the landscape, uh, you know, ultimately beginning in the sky and, and coming into the river was a much lower temperature than the water that's been in the river system and has had time to sit close to the surface and warm up as it sits in the flood and travels, or um, sits in the river and travels towards Lake Champlain. Um, so yeah, as that buoy was holding on for dear life, um, it was able to collect all these data for us and um, give us a really interesting picture of exactly what was happening in the river um, during the flood. So I'm really excited to see how this is going to turn out. Um, <laughs> in terms of the musical exercise. I, 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 I mean, for any of you who have seen a musical score, you could, um, uh, uh, you could just imagine two instruments playing, playing those two things, right? Um, wonderful, okay, so, so this is what um, we're, gonna, we're gonna try here a, 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 a bit. Um, uh, Madeline's going to, to, to give you folks some, some pencils and some paper, and we're going to see what, what might, might come out of this, this uh, 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 little chunks of this, this data set here. So, um, May Kate, the, the, the temperature here, okay? Uh, yep. um, uh, uh, do, you, do you know offhand, okay, the, the, the lowest and the highest values? Um, I here? don't know off the top of my head. Okay, okay, let's, let's just scan these a little bit here. Yeah, we could sort it real quickly in the spreadsheet. Uh, there's a couple steps to the process of sonification. Okay, the the first thing that we do, okay, in 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 the mathematical world, okay, is that we find the range of the data, okay, which is what I was just asking about. Okay, so 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 the the highest data point right now is 26.3. Okay. And the lowest data point we're going to round is 18.3. So, so if we subtract those two, what, what number do we get next? Eight, right? Okay. So, so, so the range of our data is eight. Okay, well, well, goodness gracious. Okay, if we include that octave, do re mi fa sol la ti do. Okay, so so in the sonification world, the next thing that we do, we have to divide up the range into eight chunks, into eight equal pieces. Okay, so, so that means that, the, the, that down on the low end of it, okay, if we're starting with 18.3, okay, that first chunk is going to be 18.3 to 19.3. Okay, then, then 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, and 25, and 26. 
Okay, so 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 on 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 the <laughs> and uh, you, you can do it horizontally or, or vertically. Just just write out those these these eight eight little little sections, right? Okay, and and each of those eight sections is going to have have a range of data that that we'll find. So that so, so, so that first one, okay, you, you'll label eighteen point three to actually nineteen point two. Then the next one, the next little chunk is 19.3 to 20.2. Okay, then the third one, okay, um, 20.3 to 22.2. You, you're going to see why this is going to work in a second, so just trust me. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Or, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I misspoke. Sorry, sorry, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, 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 so now we've divided up our range into eight equal chunks. Right? Okay, now. Okay. Next day. Each one of those chunks, okay? The very first one, you're gonna put dough. So dough is gonna be the note that is activated by any data point in your set that falls in that 18.3 to 19.2 range. The, the, the the next one will be Ray. The next chunk, me. And Fa, So, La, Ti, and Do. So, for any measurement that you find, you play that specific note. All right. Right, and so what? Um, what this is? This is the way of translating the number to the note. Okay, so so let's just let's just play a little bit here. Okay, um, twenty six point three. That's going to be the high dough, right? Right. That that that's the top of our data set, isn't it? Right. Right. Um, Okay, well, 26.29, that's, that's going to be the same note, right? No change. Hmm? Literally no change. Yeah, yeah I, I sorted it, so okay. we probably want to reset it. Oh, okay. So the data are in order oh, by oh, time. Oh, 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 thank you. Oh. No worries. My goodness gracious. Okay. Yep. Um, it can uh, it can work in lots of different ways, and, and, and actually the choice of, of the particular way that you want to use the math is one of the creative choices. Okay, and, and and as I find working with my scientific colleagues, they do stuff with data all the time. Okay, resorting it, relooking at it all the time, and so in in the, this is one of these these instances where scientists and musicians are actually thinking very much alike. Okay. Okay. So, so, so we're back in order now, right? Yes. Correct. It's okay. in order by time. Okay. Okay. So, so here's here's what we're going to do for those of you, okay, who have who have um, been been writing down all these numbers here. Okay. We have our our translation code our code here, right? Okay. We 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 pick a number that's going to make a note. That's going to make a musical note for us. Okay. So so let's just start at the top of the data set right here. Okay, 23.6, okay. Um, actually, I'm gonna keep track of things, things here as well. Um, uh, uh, there, there, 
another pencil over there? Yes. Okay, there we go. Okay, so 23.6, what is our first note? La. La. Okay, 23.5, 4. Also la? We get two laws. 23.58. Get a whole lot of laws here. <laughs> Once every 15 minutes, it doesn't change that quickly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so, so let's actually um, zip down to, to number eight here. 24.03. What would that be? T. T. Okay, now we're talking here. And we get several T's here, right? Okay, if we just scan those notes, we see a lot of 24s, right? See these? Okay, so, so one of the things that, that we're learning uh, <laughs> about the data is that it, it kind of looks like it, it sticks in, in, in one area for a while before it shifts, right? As opposed to being volatile every single data point going up and down. Okay, we're already starting to, 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 to kind of get, get a sense for this thing. We, we're going to get a whole bunch of laws. We're going to get a whole bunch of T's. A whole bunch of T's. Look at all those 24's there, right? If you had it a week later, it would all of a sudden go boom. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so now we're going to get a whole bunch of, tw of 23's, right? Okay, um, 23 is what? So we get a whole bunch of laws again. We're going back to back to laws. We're scanning down here. Whole bunches of laws, right? Okay. Um, oh, here's some 25s. What's that? Okay, and we get a bunch of 25s. All right. Uh, oh, now we're back to 24s. Back to 25, right? Back to high dough again, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little baby shark, yeah. yeah. Uh, n n now we're back to 24s again. Mm -hmm. T, okay. And back to back to 25 again. All right, back to dough. Lots of 25s. Okay, 26s, that's, that, that, that's still, right? Um, let's just scan all the way down until we start to get some different. We're getting close to the flood, so. We're getting close to the flood, okay. We okay. should, yep. Anticipation. Yes. Okay, um, 24 is what, what, was what again? T. T. Okay, so we're going back down to T. All right, we're getting close. Hang on, oh, oh, here we go. Yes, yes, 23s. Twenty twos. Twenty ones. Twenty. Then we got rays. Oh, oh, a little volatility here. Going back to me again, right? Back to Ray again with the, with the 19s, right? Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. Um, let's just take, take that much of it right now, okay? So what we learned here was that 
was that, okay, to, to, to take every single one of, uh, of these notes, we get a lot of repetition. Okay, so, may, so, so maybe what we want to do is, is to compress those, okay, into, in, into notes, okay, that then can turn into, into a melody of some, of some kind here, right? So let's just hear what this data is given us so far. Okay, so, so here is this in the <laughs> in the key of C. Okay, the the um, the first part of the data set here starts here. Could turn into a whole bunch of stuff. That can be a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> There can be orchestras in that. There can be choirs in that. There can be lots of different things. Um, uh, I, haven't, I haven't run the numbers on this, so this is the first time I've, I've heard it, too. <laughs> right? And so, um, so, so we start to see how the translation happens, and we get this kind of core musical content to, um, to, start, to, to start the composition process with. Um, and so, uh, this is a little taste of what is to come. Okay, as uh, you know, I'll be writing some some music for for, for choirs and, and probably the orchestra of Northern New York, um, and then we'll have we'll have three other other composers writing music for various kinds of ensembles, various kinds of music styles. Um, I, I'm uh, I'm interviewing composers this week, actually, so, so I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to, to to nailing them down and, and, and getting them into the into the project here. But but so much of this is is really a a chance for us to um, to return this. This very ancient relationship between between the sciences and the arts. Um, this 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 notion that that Pythagoras thought thought that that um, that that music was 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 numbers and time, and that and that music and was the best way to express what the universe was and the movements of the heavenly bodies. Um, Galileo, he played the lute. He was a very good lute player. And, and Galileo's dad, Vincenzo, he was, he was a composer at the time. Oh, and a very rebellious composer at that. Pushing the, pushing the limits of, uh, of music theory and, 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 and tuning in, in ways that, that a lot of the other, other contemporaries in the, the late 1500s were very angry at, at, at Vincenzo Galilei for this. And so, and so the, young, the young Galileo not only learned to play lute from his dad, but also learned, learned how to push against the assumptions of the world around him, right? Okay, and, and he would go on to, to to do that with with our, our understanding of of the, of the heavens and so many other interesting scientific uh, things that, that Galileo did it's, it's actually around the time of Galileo where the sciences and the arts start to part 
in, in the way that we think of ourselves as intellectual beings, we start to separate those two things. So, so, so now in, in the public school, the, you know, the, 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 math, the math classroom's over here, but the music room is over there, right? And, the, uh, and in order for the math teacher to get that necessary break that they need in the middle of the day, because teaching is hard work, well, all the kids that were, were in the math class are now in the music class. <laughs> And that means that the math teacher and the music teacher can never teach together <laughs> because the schedule prohibits it, right? They can't collaborate in front of kids and to show, to show this, this back and forth you know, between people of, of different knowledge bases and to, and, to, and to build these new connections, build these new ways of understanding the world around us. So, so um, we're gonna be doing a bunch of that in the next two years here with, with the Lake Champlain Basin program, and uh, and so you should all keep your eyes open for, for for concert events or other or other other presentations like this. Um, you know, perhaps once when we get our composers on board, we might uh, put together some some um, events where they can show their work in progress. Maybe, okay, we we can follow them. Uh, the there's a uh, the beginnings of our website up. Which, which you can all follow the, the, the work of these, these composers. Uh, we'll, we'll make sure all, all that information gets out to you. Um, it's gonna be a wonderful journey here in the next two, <laughs> two years. And, and, so, and so thank you for, for, for uh, kicking us off from the dock here on, on, this, on this journey. And, um, and, uh, and, and uh, <laughs> what I hope you do is that, is that you, you, you go back and like pull down like, like weather weather.com and start, start sonifying the, 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 the humidity data and then, you know, and, and at home here. So, so um, thank, you, uh, thank you so much for, for all, the, all the folks that made, made this happen. Okay, for May Kate, for, for, for Madeline, for, for Jim, for Colleen, for, for, and, and, and Mike's, um, Mike's wonderful place here that, that we're in. So thanks for coming out tonight, folks. Thank you.